So let's talk about Spawn. More specifically, let's talk about the first 100 issues of Spawn, because after issue 100, they made an epilogue. So it's a good bookend for the character and for creator Todd McFarlane, who was one of the guys who helped start Image Comics. Uh, that's the company that produced Spawn, and in fact, I think it might be worthwhile to talk about Image itself before you really get to Spawn, because so much of these Spawn issues are a reflection of Image Comics itself. So let me start by saying that I'm not sure that Image Comics has ever produced a single good idea since it came into being. Part of this is that all of the guys who founded the company were guys that had bad ideas or had no ideas at all. The rest, guys like McFarlane, were young creators who wouldn't actually become good writers or storytellers until years later. Image Comics itself is a strange thing. It's the embodiment of that guy you hate makes a good point meme. See, the creators of Image Comics felt that they were being underappreciated and mistreated at Marvel and DC, which they were. Marvel and DC have a long history of mistreating their writers and artists, a practice that really hasn't changed to this day. The problem is, as I said before, that the guys who founded Image were not the guys to strike a blow for everybody. They were the absolute worst people to do this, both because many of them were terrible people with terrible ideas, but also because many of them were also bitter, angry guys with an axe to grind, and it comes off in all of their comics. In fact, an entire issue of Spawn is dedicated to that, and we're going to get to that. So knowing this, an obvious question comes up, how did characters like Spawn make it to 100 issues? The answer, I think, lies in the world in which Image Comics was created. Make no mistake, Image Comics could not have been created before or after the boom period of the 90s. The market was horribly saturated with every terrible idea possible, and the rising tide sort of lifted all boats. Simply put, the same market that allowed Wolverine and Deadpool to suck up so many comics allowed things like Image Comics to stay afloat. Now, some may think that I'm being overly harsh by saying that, but as we'll get into, Spawn is certainly not interesting or creative enough to exist on its own. But before we get to that, we need to discuss the elephant in the room, which is, is Spawn a ripoff? Now, you might think, well, obviously not, because he's existed for this long, and he sort of has his own look. And the courts agreed with this, because yes, there were courts involved. So here's the thing. After Spawn launched, it became very obvious that Spawn was a fairly big ripoff of other characters, namely Batman and the Punisher. Uh, they would be the first of many characters McFarlane would rip off during Spawn's first 100 issues, but were not there yet. Anyway, the courts found that Spawn was unique enough that he wasn't a ripoff, and so he was owned by McFarlane and Image. So here's where I bring up the point of these were not the people to strike a blow for creative freedom back up again. McFarlane dedicates a full issue to the fact that he won his court case. He depicts all of Marvel and DC's major heroes as being in hell, talking about them as broken figures enslaved by evil masters who corrupted them. It's uninteresting, and it's insufferable. It's the comic equivalent of those diss tracks that musicians and bands with no ideas write, the ones that are all about industry drama that literally no one can relate to or has any interest in. Now, if you think listening to McFarlane whine about how everyone else destroys their creations, how they're all soulless and evil, is boring and annoying, congratulations, you're right. Part of it might be that McFarlane only won because he was ripping off so many different things that he didn't rip off any one thing completely, and we're going to get to that. Spawn as a character is what happens when you were a teenager and were scribbling in your notebook. He was never meant to be a character because he's not that deep. Okay, so I've avoided talking about Spawn himself for long enough. Who is Spawn as a character? Well, he's a former Dirty Jobs assassin figure who decided that he had enough and who was killed by his boss as a result. He then makes a deal with the devil to see his wife again, and the devil brings him back to life five years later, intending to break Spawn's will so that he'll be a general in Hell's army when it marches against heaven. And you might think that I'm making all of this sound very interesting, and I assure you it isn't. And the reason that it isn't is because it's all overloaded with nonsense, and it makes it equal parts unappealing and extremely repetitive. For example, 
Early on, one of the revelations is that Spawn, a black man, was brought back as a white man. That's the level of pathos we're dealing with here. But don't worry, because that's quickly forgotten about and doesn't come up again. But the story itself goes like this. Spawn comes back to life, finds out that his wife has moved on and has married his best friend, and they've had a kid together, because he's been gone for five years. Now, here's a great way to demonstrate how immature and badly written this comic is. We have a setup that works. Spawn has come back from the dead, and he's realized that the two most important people in his life have now gotten together and have a happy life together. So, how do you think Spawn actually responds. If you picked break into the house, violently grab his wife, and scream at her like an insane person, you're right. No, I'm serious. He literally breaks into their home in the dark, grabs his wife, and starts ranting like a maniac about how she's betrayed him by marrying his best friend. Keep in mind, this is a woman he supposedly still loves. Imagine loving someone and thinking that the best way to engage with them is to surprise them in the dark while dressed like a superhero and ranting like a maniac. This begins the first of many occasions where Spawn storms off to brood like he's a child. By the way, remember when I said that the series is repetitive? McFarlane repeats this scene of Spawn showing up to a woman who doesn't know him, who thinks he's some crazy stalker, several times, and it never changes. The same events play out over and over again. In fact, each time it happens, it makes you hate Spawn more, because it's clear he's the only person who refuses to move on the way everyone else has. Later on, Spawn reconciles with his best friend, the one who married his wife, only to immediately think the worst of him every time something seems wrong. The first time it happens is because Spawn finds him working for the guy who killed him, unaware that he's undercover trying to figure out what happened to Spawn, because Spawn didn't tell anybody what happened to him. Spawn, however, is a moron, and so he immediately thinks that his best friend has betrayed him and declares them to be enemies. The second time it happens is because Spawn gets his face back, his real black face back, at which point his first instinct isn't to go and see his wife and talk to her like an adult and say that they have to move on because they're different people now and she's happy and he wants her to be happy. No, that would be too mature and too rational for this comic. Spawn instead goes to his best friend, punches him in the face, and says that he's going to come back and take his wife back from him and that they are now enemies again. This concludes later with Spawn breaking into his best friend's bathroom in the middle of the night to slam him against a wall and demand to know why the man he said was his enemy isn't helping him anymore. One thing that you'll realize while reading Spawn is that he's an abusive, violent asshole who literally alienates everybody in his life. Normal writers might realize that this is a good starting point for a character, and that a character's arc would demand that they change and realize that they are like this, and thus become a better person because they don't want to be an abusive, violent asshole who's always alone. But Spawn never does. He remains the same abusive asshole at the end of issue 100 that he starts out in issue 1 as. If anything, Spawn gets worse. He actively becomes more of an asshole and more abusive to everyone around him the longer the series goes on. And here's where the next time loop of interactions comes in. Spawn going after the guy who killed him. Because you see, Spawn knows who killed him. And he makes a habit of breaking into the guy's office and holding him at gunpoint, saying that he knows what he did and that he's going to pay, and then just leaving. Not leaving like Batman leaving the room, leaving more like a petulant child, swearing that he's going to come back and kill him later. In fact, it happens so many times that the villain starts commenting on how many times Spawn does it. More than that, Spawn acts like an insane person, showing up and ranting about how this guy needs to stay away from his wife and best friend. Keep in mind, one of the things about Spawn is that no one knows who he is. No one knows his real name, no one knows his face, because he doesn't have a face anymore. So no one actually has any idea that he's connected to anyone. So the guy who killed him has no reason to even so much as look at his wife or best friend, because he thinks that the guy who Spawn is is dead. To put it another way, imagine if somebody burst into the room on a regular basis and yelled, stay away from Jim who lives at 101 House Lane. Who's Jim? 
Why do I care about him? Why don't you want me to look into him? Better question, who are you and how are you two related? And again, this happens at least seven times in a hundred issues. It happens over and over again, where Spawn shows up and starts ranting about how the guy who killed him needs to stay away from these people that he didn't care about or know about until Spawn showed up and started ranting about them. Moving beyond that, we need to talk about Cog. Who is Cog? Cog is apparently our cryptic mentor figure. Except he's not really a mentor because Spawn is too violent, angry, and abusive to ever listen to anyone. Not that Cog ever has anything worth saying. Because what McFarlane is going for is an inversion of the cryptic mentor trope, where the mentor doesn't have anything worth saying, and the hero ignores him and succeeds anyway. Except Spawn never succeeds, and Cog never stops being pointlessly vague. I wish to point out that this happens nearly every three issues. Spawn will do something stupid and short-sighted, and Cog will then show up and say something cryptic like, you're playing into their hands, Spawn, you'd take back control. Spawn will then yell angrily that he's doing exactly that, and then go do something stupid and short-sighted again, which leads back into Cog being cryptic for no reason. It happens over and over again. It seriously feels like a time loop with how often they do this. Okay, so now that I've covered that, we need to cover the blind black grandmother. Now, I'll be honest, when I was originally reading this comic, I didn't think it was that racist, but writing it out, it absolutely feels racist. So... Spawn's grandmother is a fat, black, blind woman who is very religious and wise, and who Spawn goes to in between temper tantrums to hear wisdom he's not going to listen to. Now, she thinks he's an angel because she can't see him, and so she can't see that he's a monster, and so each time she tells him that God must be paying attention to him, and him specifically, and brought him back for a reason. Now, this might work, except... Spawn spends the entire series ignoring what she tells him and practically doing the opposite of what she says over and over again. Speaking of God, let's talk about the cosmology for a moment because McFarlane spends an ungodly amount of time on it and it's really stupid. So here's the thing. I might really dislike Neil Gaiman's comics because they keep getting weirdly grafted onto the DC Universe where they don't belong or fit, but Gaiman's purpose for writing is to explain weird, esoteric ideas and concepts, which means even when his worst ideas get a lot of airtime, he's given them lots of thought. McFarlane, however, didn't do nearly so much work, and I need to mention all this because what I'm going to say might seem like it's really deep, and it's not. I want to stress that it's not nearly as deep as I'm going to make it sound. In the Image universe, morality does not matter at all. You were a saint? Doesn't matter. You were a demented serial killer and child rapist? Doesn't matter. There is a god and there is a devil, but where you end up has nothing to do with what you do on earth. Instead, souls are divided up like draft picks, with the intent being that neither side gets more or better souls than the other. And because this is so woefully juvenile, yes, they do go out of their way to say that Attila the Hun and Adolf Hitler are in heaven, specifically because heaven doesn't want them to be in hell. Now, a smart person might have realized that if you were going to create a world where heaven and hell were taking souls based on a draft system, that they could use Earth to craft the kinds of people that they'd want. But this concept is never thought of, and is instead used to be extremely juvenile and cruel for the sake of being cruel. McFarlane goes out of his way multiple times to show the reader that actually God doesn't care and never did, and you're probably going to be tortured in hell forever, and you probably did nothing to deserve it, because God is an uncaring, aloof figure who is only concerned with fighting the devil, without really explaining why he cares so much about this. At every turn, the writing reveals that none of this is very thought out, it's just a way for Spawn to angst more about how unfair everything is, because you see, it's all about Spawn at all times. Now, you'll notice that I haven't really talked a lot about Spawn himself and what he's up to, and that's because beyond the time loops, he really doesn't do anything except brood like a child. Seriously. 
Now, the comic reviewer Linkara refers to Frank Miller's Batman as Crazy Steve, the insane and violent homeless man who somehow steals all of Batman's gear, but that name might as well be assigned to Spawn because he is literally a crazy homeless man. You see, Spawn's lair is literally in the alleyways, and he lives among the homeless. I should point out that this leads to lots of really stupid pontificating about how homeless people are all secretly wise sages who the world doesn't understand. And yes, it gets extremely preachy at points. Look, I'm all for treating the homeless better, but the idea that the homeless are all extremely wise sages who have secret wisdom, if only we would listen to the madness, is itself madness, and again, extremely juvenile and childish. It reeks of, they're different, so clearly they must be geniuses. There's another reason why I haven't really talked much about Spawn, and that's because Spawn himself is very uneven. He doesn't really have a set character, or a set of powers, or even really any kind of set structure. Earlier I said that Spawn was basically ripping off everything, and I meant that. Spawn's powers and his actions are defined mostly by whatever McFarlane thought was cool at the time. And this is quite literal. The first thing that Spawn does is get a bunch of really large guns and swears to clean up the world of filth, and he essentially becomes the Punisher for a while. Then he becomes Batman, and he starts acting as some kind of detective, large hood and all. He, he starts striking from the shadows and digging up secret information. And then he becomes the Ghost Rider for, like, five issues, Penance, Snare, and all. Like, he uses it exactly once, and then he just never uses it again. Going further than that, he becomes the Spectre, killing evildoers in ironic ways to punish them for their sins. And that also only lasts a few issues. Beyond that, Spawn's abilities are, like, super inconsistent. His powers are almost always entirely plot-dependent. Like, one comic, he's remaking his body out of bugs and rats and snakes, and the next, he's somehow able to cure his best friend's brain tumor with his magical healing powers that he somehow has and doesn't know about. One issue, he brings a homeless guy who was shot through the head back to life, and then, in another issue, he's somehow able to use his suit like a symbiote. Speaking of, you know what was really popular in the 90s? Venom. You know who Spawn also rips off? Venom. Because you see, Spawn's suit works exactly like Venom. It's a symbiote. It's also black and can turn into anything the user needs. It also evolves, but it's never clear how or why it does or what this process requires. It just happens to explain why Spawn gets new powers every 10 issues or so. This is what I mean when I say that Spawn rips off so many different characters that it's impossible to say he's ripping off any particular one. I will say that while he's cosplaying emo Spider-Man meets Frank Miller's Batman, they start up another bizarre time loop idea where people openly wonder if Spawn exists. Now, one thing you need to understand is that Spawn is not a subtle character. He's not Batman. He's more like Superman. He cuts large swaths of destruction across the city he's in. He burned Spawn Lives in big, bold green flames on a wall. He literally killed a child molester and put his name on the guy and hung the guy's corpse in the middle of the police station. And yet, people continue to ask if he exists. Characters who have met Spawn ask whether or not he exists. Literally, there are characters who have had conversations with him who will randomly ask each other, you think he's real? Which is baffling, because imagine if somebody looked at you and went, you think birds are real? and we're completely serious. Now actually, imagine if somebody asked you that while you were running an aviary, because that's how weird it is, and it's played completely straight without any jokes whatsoever. Now I wish to point out that I've written like 3,000 words so far, and I have yet to say anything good about Spawn. So the question becomes, is there anything good in the first 100 issues? And yes, there is. Uh, there's about three issues towards the end that are good. The plot's pretty simple. It's a big evil god thing that is going to wake up and destroy the world, and heaven will invade to stop it, and hell will use that as an excuse to then start the end times. And what's sad is that this shows what Spawn should have been all along, a character who exists between heaven and hell, who fights all the things that would be used as an excuse for hell to start the final days. It's actually a very good few issues. 
Although, uh, during the middle of it, Spawn becomes one with the Earth, who apparently is its own force separate from Heaven and Hell, because Spawn is now Swamp Thing, and it communes with the Green. Yeah, Spawn Thing rips off Swamp Thing, too. But anyway, Spawn is a mess of a series. Does it at least end well? No. In fact, the ending might as well be the biggest slap in the face that you can imagine, despite everything that I've already said. You see, the series is not paced very well, and when I say that, the last few issues are good, I mean that they're so close to the end that Spawn only has enough time to wrap the entire plot up in, like, two issues. Like, Spawn tries to set up, depict, and then resolve his final battle with the devil in, like, the last two issues. That's not a joke. Like, he quite literally goes to hell, kills the devil, and then somebody else who isn't named shows up and is like, okay, you can be king of hell now, and Spawn just goes, no thanks, and leaves. And that's it. That's the end. There's no satisfying resolution. There's no real triumph. He just shows up, kills the devil, and leaves. Like, he could have done this at any time. And, you know what? After, like... Sitting through a hundred issues of this garbage, I was just kind of happy to be done with it. Like, you know what? Thank God it's over. Yeah, it was rushed, and it took two issues to solve all the problems, but you know what? It's over. Like, there's even a little, like, look how much Spawn has changed section at the end of the hundredth issue that shows all his little suit changes as he becomes more like various other comic characters over the hundred issues. And I was so utterly exhausted by all of this that I just felt some kind of relief. Like this long nightmare of trying to figure out how this all came to be and kept going was over. And uh, and then I read the epilogue. And I'm not certain I've ever, ever read a comic that made me so angry so quickly before. Without having some kind of like offensive like content in it. So, like, here's the thing. The epilogue is nothing put everything that I've already talked about distilled into a single issue. I'm dead serious. Like, he goes to his wife, and he terrifies her. He has a fight with his best friend. He goes and finds the guy who killed him, and threatens him again, and then just decides to kill him with no fanfare. And then, the moment that kind of pushed me over the edge, and pissed me off to no end, occurs. So, Spawn goes to the blind old woman again, who is his grandmother, and he's like, actually, your faith is a lie, your god doesn't care, you're an idiot and a fool. And he starts like yelling at her and berating her and tells her, in no uncertain terms, that everything she believes, her entire faith and everything that makes up who she is, is a lie and that she's being played and that she's probably going to hell. And he's like, you're worthless and weak, and you would be better off if you renounced God, because God doesn't care about you. And if this sounds like the kind of thing that every stupid asshole in high school thought was edgy, you're not wrong. What makes it so very infuriating is that it becomes unclear whether this is meant to be in-universe, or if this is McFarland venting his spleen about something. Like, there's other moments in the first hundred issues like this, like, earlier I mentioned the ugly issue where he talks about winning in court, but this is just kind of like stomping on the reader's face about how insufferable the character is. Spawn is every abusive asshole that you've ever met who justifies his terrible behavior with the idea that God clearly doesn't care, because if he did, why would he allow them to act that way? Like, if he can do it, clearly that means that God doesn't care about it, and it's just completely in-your-face jackassery. It just drives home that this character is utterly irredeemable, and shame on you for thinking he could be anything else. Oh, and uh, just for good measure, after he's done berating an old blind woman for believing in God and him, and supporting him for the last hundred issues, Cog shows up to be needlessly obtuse and tell Spawn that he's on the wrong track. And the whole thing ends with Spawn saying that he doesn't care, and storming off again like a child. If the 100 issue ended with a plop, like it was a turd in a toilet, then the epilogue is like somebody taking that turd and smashing it in your face. It's like McFarlane is rubbing in your face that Spawn is terrible and will always be terrible, 
and he's never going to be good. Like, he's laughing at you for reading 100 issues of this. He's laughing at you, the reader, who he clearly views with contempt. Like, that's how all of this comes across. It comes across like he's a bitter, hateful person who actively thinks you're stupid for reading his comics. Now, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's what he thinks. I know that's what it feels like reading his epilogue. Like, it feels like somebody told him, hey, you set up a billion plot threads, and none of them went anywhere, and we feel like we wasted our time, and McFarlane went, oh yeah, fine then, I'll wrap them all up, and then just spit in their face. Like, in the beginning of this, I said that my theory was that Spawn only existed because the 90s speculation market allowed every bad idea to rise to the surface. I have no idea what keeps the character around today. Like, I can't say that I'm very interested either, having read the first hundred issues of this. Like, if I can convey nothing else to you, just remember this. If it has the Image Comics logo on it, just stay away from it, because they thought stuff like this was worth publishing. 